that those projects became so controversial. I understand that change is hard, and in a community like this, it, it seems to be particularly hard for people to understand that the street belongs to the people. Um, and and so that those conversations were hard for this community to have, but we had them, and we got through them. And I feel like, just like climate, bike, bikes, um, safety and access is a part of what it is to be San Luis Obispo now. And so I feel confident that um, even when I'm off council, that safe routes to schools and all of those things will continue forward and things like that. And not to mention the beautiful, you know, downtown parklets program, which I think showed uh, such a strong ability on the part of this whole community. But again, in particular, in this case, on the part of staff to move at a pace that the emergency demanded in a way that really saved businesses, and not just saved businesses, but really saved the sense of culture and community in San Luis Obispo, and gave people hope, and gave people a safe way to go outside and support, again, not just the businesses, but also be with each other. Um, often, one of the challenges and the frustrations around governance is that, or government, is that it's slow, right? Democracy is intentionally slow. Um, and when it came to the pandemic, uh, we were able to speed some of that up in a way that was really useful and saved people's businesses and saved, in some ways, the culture of this town. So that's another thing I'm proud of. But, you know, this sort of, this story that is frankly a false story about rugged individualism in this country really needs to be called out and called up. And we really need to start shifting from, yeah, here it is. It's never been true. It's never been true. Um, and it's not true now. And I, I understand, especially those of us that are out west, you know, we are the descendants of folks who believed in rugged individualism and believed in manifest destiny and all of those things and struck out on their own, etc. And so it's really embedded in our culture and it's having toxic and at times deadly impacts on our communities. And you're seeing that in a lot of the conversations around the pandemic, whether it's masks or vaccines or going back to school or what have you. And so those have been really concerning and disappointing conversations to observe. Um, and I understand that these are complex topics and people are afraid on so-called all sides, but I'm hopeful that we can uh, get together, uh, understand um, that this is a we, not a me situation, and do better on... Also, <laughs> I don't know what to say about the fact that people don't seem to have, have lost the ability to understand basic science and reality. I, I honestly don't know what the solution is to that, but it would be nice if we could figure out how, a way to get um, more unified, which does not mean that we share the same perspective or point of view, but where we can come together across those differences. Again, we have so many challenges with this. If, if people think COVID was hard, again, I know I sound like a, <laughs> is it monomaniacal? Is that the right word? On climate change. But if you think COVID was hard, wait till climate crisis really yeah. hits. Yeah. And we, I, I, I'm not seeing us being prepared. And I just don't mean like infrastructure of the city. I mean the infrastructure of our own hearts and the infrastructure of this community connection. And that's really concerning to me. So when we end up having floods or wildfires or climate migrants on the move and all of those things that we know are coming, um, I would like to see us grow closer together so that we can turn towards each other and not on each other when those moments hit. activist than mayor at times. How are you not proving those people right by stepping down as mayor midway to be an activist? What I've always done is what I believe to be the right thing 
and and I do have I, I am absolutely biased towards my own kids and their generation and I feel great about it <laughs> to my kids when I was 12 years old myself, even though they weren't born yet, let's not get that rumor started. Um, <laughs> that'll be the next one. Um, that I wanted to be the best mom that I could. And I know it sounds silly or cliche or whatever, what have you, but that has been the organizing value of my entire life, which is why climate change, I think, impacts me and inspires me to get involved so much. Because I know that their lives and their next their whole generation's lives are going to be impacted and potentially shortened and that's not okay with me so i have always in the moment asked myself what is the thing i can do in this moment as one person what's the next biggest best thing where are my strengths best suited and like i said in my comments i think a lot of us actually are taking a pause right now um, after or after this big wave of covid and asking ourselves am i living my best life. This is really where I'm meant to be. And I have so loved having this opportunity to be the mayor for the last five years, the city of San Luis Obispo. And so few people get to say what I'm about to say. And that is with all of your um, collaboration, I did what I came here to do. I promised tiny homes. We, we put out the first legal tiny home permit in the state of California. You know, I promised bike paths. We, we have them. More housing. We're getting them climate action, number one, diversity, first in, in our city's history. And so as I was reflecting, really feeling like, okay, I think I need to take, ramp this up at the state level because my kids' lives are depending on it. And I, and it's not hyperbole to say that, I mean, I texted, actually texted the city manager and our sustainability manager. I'm getting texts from my son, my kids saying, mom, are you hopeful? I don't feel hopeful. Are we all gonna die? Is this the apocalypse? And I'm literally crying myself to sleep, thinking, because I don't know what to say to them. I don't know how to answer them anymore. I cannot tell them anymore, like I used to when they were little, it's gonna be okay. It's not, it would not be in integrity for me to turn to my kid and look them in the eye and say it's going to be okay because it's clear that it may not be okay. But what I can tell them, what I can look them in the eye and say, I will do everything in my power to make it as okay for you as I can. And so that's what I'm doing, and that's why I'm choosing. In that, what, would, what are your immediate goals in your new role? What do you hope to push for immediately? So, we are, a lot of organizations, and this one included, is focusing on um, encouraging or demanding the governor to declare a climate state of emergency, which in that case is not just symbolic, it does give him extra powers. So that's one of the main things, but also other key pieces of legislation that we'll be working on across the state. Some, some much more significant climate legislation that hopefully the legislatures um, up in Sacramento, especially those that continue to take fossil fuel money, um, we can encourage them to stop taking that money and stop, start focusing on the future in serious ways. Um, because now, of course, we're not just talking about keeping it in the ground in terms of fossil fuels, we're talking about also having to be prepared with very significant resources to um, deal with what's coming. As this report said, I don't know if you caught that in my comments, but we are baked in for the next 30 years with climate impacts, so there's nothing really, it sounds like, um, we can do to uh, keep that from happening. So now what we're talking about, like I said, when my kid is standing up at a podium when they're in their 50s, uh, I want them to be talking about something else, hopefully, that we will have be begun to solve this problem and that emissions will be going down and that the um, deadly, frankly, and economically devastating outcome of, of all of those things is starting to ramp down instead of continuing to ramp up. So it'll be focused on the governor and then um, really key pieces of legislation going around the state and helping others in their own community engage with their own legislators and um, encourage them to, to take more substantive climate action. Heidi, um, do you plan to run for any higher office in the future? Yes, I just wanted to announce, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be running for president. Um, <laughs> That's it. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah, don't put a weird headline in it. <laughs> Please. I don't need the headlines. That's the thing I'm going to campaign for next. Accurate headlines in all the papers. Um, you know, I, again, kind of what I was saying a minute ago, I'm always trying to figure out and where is the place for me to be, best place for me to be. And if at a future date that actually feels meaningful, I would do it. Like, I'm in it to win it here. You know, I'm going to do whatever it takes. Um, to make sure that I'm doing the most, you know. So I've been in encampments in the middle of Texas with um, activists fighting the tar sands pipeline being built. And I've been in public office. So I've been in a lot of different spaces. That I, so I have a unique and pretty vast background in terms of the, the things that I've done. But every single one of those decisions has been an attempt at least to answer the question like what can I do as one person what's the most I can do in this moment to make change. So I don't st I don't see that happening to be honest. Um, but if, but if it ends up feeling like the right thing to do, I would, I would consider it. I, I have, have a no question. plans to do that. And I heard you. Um, what's your stance on uh, how police treat citizens uh, who call in uh, safety reports? And when they want wellness health checks, last night I was arrested because I called in for my family, okay? I called in for my family a wellness check for my three-year-old niece, my 18-year-old niece, my brother, my sister. I live in Paso Robles, and I have been getting harassed for the last well, my whole life actually, but you know, for the last like three years, and it's been nonstop. And Pastor Robles did not come and help me. The police came and they, they, they patronized me. They gaslight me. They abused me. Okay. I knew and I to hear that happen. I want to know your stance on that. Well, as you're saying, that's the Pastor Robles. Department. I'm talking about here last night. So I was arrested here last night when I called in. You, I was having a mental health crisis. If you, what would be really useful is And I was details. having a mental health crisis, ma'am. Would you like to hear my story or I, not? I feel like I have the gist of your story. Oh, you got the gist of it? Okay. Tell and me so how it is then. What it would be useful is if you reported that to either... I fucking did, bitch! I'm sorry to talk to you no like that, line. but that's no how line. I was treated last the night. I this, treated, the I was treated, I was arrested when I called Come in a me. wellness affair. I don't want to talk right. to you. Take your hands off me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.